Oh, so many games that I want to play on the channel. I wish I had some sort of guidance to help me decide. Well, that's a start. Greetings fellow flat caps and welcome to the Spectrum. During the 70s, the subject and concepts of video games left developers spoilt for choice when it came to pleasing a demanding audience. Name a subject, anything, and there it was. History? Check. Sports? Check. Movies? Check. Simple challenges? Check. Sci-fi? Check. Fantasy? Check. Gambling? Check. Se- uh, uh... Sex? Yes, there was indeed porn games for the Atari way before the days of Leisure Suit Larry. Point being, there was no lack of inspiration for game developers, and today's game series takes us to the Old West. So saddle up, grab yourself a posse, but most important of all, watch out for snakes in your boots. Boot Hill is a versus game where two cowboys engage in a shootout. Quite a fitting name really, as Boot Hill was a term used during the 19th and early 20th century to refer to graveyards of gunfighters in Western America. Some of you retro fans out there may recognise that Boot Hill has a prequel named Gunfight. But, did you know what inspired Gunfight? And what if I told you it was in fact an electromagnetic puppet game? As we did in Breakout, we're going to go back a few years before Boot Hill's release to find out how it came to being. From 1977 to 1969. Nice. The original Gunfight was a... Uh, as Arcade Dreams puts it, Video games before video games existed. In it, each player controls a puppet, which could move from side to side. The goal was to defeat your opponent in a shootout by scoring more kills than them in 30 seconds. For its time, this was state-of-the-art stuff. It even got fancy and had destructible cactuses if they were shot. How EM machines worked was dependent on the game. In the case of Gunfight, it worked like a light gun game does. Your gun would fire out a light whenever the trigger was pulled. If it hit a light sensitive sensor on a target, then it would trigger the effect on said target. It looks really cool and it's a shame I may never get to try one in person. But if anyone actually has, please share your experiences below. This is very intriguing to me. Six years later, Taito jumps in and adapts it into an actual video game under the name Western Gun. Midway also released their own version of the same game, however it was named Gunfight. There were some differences between Taito's and Midway's versions. Western Gun was black and white and used discrete logic for its programming, while Gunfight had a transparent yellow overlay over the screen and used a microprocessor to improve on its frame rate. The gameplay emulates the EM game quite well, with of course some changes. Each of the players is limited to their side of the screen being able to travel so far towards the middle. You have a time of 70 seconds to fight your opponent and one hit gives a comical death to them. That is one of two sound effects that play in the entire game and it plays every time one of you is killed. The other is a gunshot that sounds like your neighbour is moving furniture. At least, in this video by Old Classic Retro Gaming. In this one by HeroDov 2 d there's only gun sounds. And in my footage, there's bugger all! One of the biggest changes was the control scheme. The cabinet of the game went against the norm and the idea of using it feels really off to me. So if I were to say, Total Carnage, The Ascent, and Xeno Crisis. What is the common theme of these control schemes? That's right, twin sticks. With the left moving your character and the right aiming your gun with maybe an additional button for shooting or using a special weapon. For Western Gun, the right stick moves your character and shoots while the left stick aims your gun. As a right-handed man, even just pretending to use these in my head makes me feel Ugh, you lefties are weird. Unlike traditional twin stick shooters, you can't shoot in a full 360 degrees, either 45 degrees high or low. 
Having played it using a keyboard, it was easy to manipulate and felt a lot easier than using it with the intended two-stick layout. It also made taunting my opponent by calling them a wanker much easier. The highest number of kills after 70 seconds wins. With each victory, the level will change and new obstacles will appear in different places, but are also destructible with some mobile. Each player has a max total of six shots. If you run out of shots, that's it. No more American pastime for you. If both players run out of bullets, it's considered a draw and the next round starts. One thing they kept the same from the Sega version, which I wish they didn't, was the AI. By which I mean, it's non-existent. It's a two-player only game. You could play against yourself and you'll always win, but that also means you'll always lose. I didn't get the chance to play two-player, but I can imagine you get quite giddy when you try to outmaneuver and throw insults to each other. Despite its simplicity, it did well in both the US and Japan. So well that Atari jumped in with a clone of their own named Outlaw. Now, let's get on to the main star of the show, Boot Hill itself. It's going to be hard to talk about this because... it's basically the same game. Huh. Todd Howard before Todd Howard. It's not exactly the same game. Some changes have been made in the same vein that you add Oreos to a dairy milk. It's better, but not much has changed and you get diabetes quicker. Wait, hang on. The rules are the same. Score higher than your opponent in 70 seconds. The differences are noticeable and it's not just the gameplay that has them. The cabinet has employed a projection system to portray the game. It would use mirrors to reflect the images onto the screen for the players to see and had a hand-drawn background to add the illusion of depth. Of course this means that an emulator won't pick this up, but through the power of editing, I can put it in. There you go. Wait. I could put anything here. As for the game itself, graphically the game is still black and white. Player 1 is on the right and the avatars have the same look and animations, but they do now shrink the higher up the screen you go to simulate distance. The soundtrack has increased by a whole two songs, one that plays when a credit is inserted, ah, yeah. Fucking hell! and an extra track that plays if player 2 is killed. Mechanic wise, you still get 6 shots. You can only move so far forward, the destructible cover is literally a copy and paste from the previous game, and the same can be said about the death animations, only with your body now ascending to the grave. The only new feature really is that you can ricochet bullets off the top and bottom of the screen to flex on your opponent. That is, if you don't count the fact there's actually an AI to play against now. They offer up a decent challenge, however it's a bastard because they blatantly cheat and don't even try to hide it. And I'm not saying that in a sore loser kind of way, I've got proof. They seem to be faster than you, they can shoot through cover at times, and they can score a point by missing you. Umph. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. You motherfucker! Bottom line, it's the same game with minor improvements and a fancy display being relied on for its main method of attraction. And this is probably where I'd leave the video. Boot Hill was a very short series of only two titles, and looking online I couldn't find any remakes, remasters, or even re-releases. The closest I could find was a gunfight port to the Astrocade. Other than that, I only found a TTRPG of the same name by Wizards of the Coast. Yes, that Wizards of the Coast. The only trivia about Boot Hill I could find was that it can be seen in the Dawn of the Dead and was in the 1001 Games You Must Play Before You Die book. So while the series may have ended, the mechanics of the game did continue to influence future generations of games. One of those games is going to appear in episode 372, but with that being a while away, a long long while away. There are actually two games that I can talk about right now for the remainder of this video. The first is a title from Nintendo named Sheriff. Also using a western theme, Sheriff sees you playing as Mr. Jack as you try to rescue Betty who's been kidnapped by bandits. You do so by standing in a square of barricades as the bandits dance the YMCA around you. To clear a level, you need to shoot each of the bandits while avoiding their shots. 
take too long and some of the bandits will enter your barricades. These ones will shoot faster in multiple directions and try to charge you. If you're feeling skillful, you can shoot a vulture for bonus points. As you whittle down the dancing banditos, they will speed up and will become more likely to charge you. After completing three levels, you get bonus points as you rescue the damsel and see the potential origins of the Zelda hearts. It's certainly a skill-based game, but it could do with some sound. Oh wait, hang on. There we go. The game does have some music and it's kind of catchy, but your gun sounds like someone letting a wet one go. Each level will play the same, but will get harder as the bandits fire more often and will get through your barricades quicker. Like its inspirations, it's a simplistic game that sticks to one trick. Yet also like its inspirations, the cabinet is where the main appeal lay. It uses the same aiming mechanic as Boot Hill. How it operates though is different. First off, you can fire in 8 directions but you can't fire nearly as fast. After firing a single shot, you need to wait until your previous shot vanishes before you can fire again, so make each one of them count. How you aim the gun is also different. Nintendo altered the control scheme once again, going against the norm. You had a left stick to move, as standard, but to aim and shoot, you used an oven dial, turning it to aim and pushing it to fire. For the time, gimmick controls like this were sure to attract the eyes of many players. And it most certainly did as it made it to the top 10 highest grossing games in the same year it was released. References to it can still be found in Nintendo's games today, with Mr. Jack as an assist trophy in the Smash Brothers series and a version of the game playable in WarioWare Inc. The final game we're going to look at in this video is one called Frontline, made by Taito in 1982. Like Sheriff, it also uses a dial control setup, but its game structure is vastly different. Frontline changed the formula up by making one of the first ever overhead run and gun shooters. You play as a lone soldier who I'm going to dub Sergeant Twinkletoes because of his footstep noise. Your goal is to fight your way across a battlefield to destroy the enemy's fort. And fuck is that a difficult task! The enemy will come at you from every angle possible. Employing the Dark Souls strategy of fuck everything and run is effective but not riskless. You can defend yourself with a gun and grenades, both with unlimited ammo, but both of which also feel horribly flawed to use. As with Sheriff, Taito took the mechanics they developed for gunfights and converted it to 8-way firing. However, firing in all 8 directions is not always possible. Your gun that shoots milk can be shot twice in a row before taking a second to reload. You can fire to the sides fine, but when shooting forward, the angle is off, and you fire slightly to the right instead of straight ahead. Handy for shooting around corners, but not when you're trying to advance. You can shoot behind you as long as you turn around, but even then, the crooked aim is still there. If you run sideways, you can flip the gun over to your left side, but running at an angle resorts it back to the right side. The gun's range is noticeably short and works against you. To hit an enemy, you need to get in range of their gun to shoot them, so exchanging shots is common practice. There is cover you can use to avoid their shots and then try and counter with your own, however the enemy attacks too often. So after taking cover and waiting for their shot, you emerge to fire back, but by the time you're in position to shoot back, the enemy has their next one ready and you're dead. This wouldn't be a problem if the guns could reach all the way to the other side of the screen, and you could fire faster being a solo force while the enemy fired slower being a multiple force. However, the fact that you have to get within their range to try and hit them back, combined with the fact that you are outnumbered, the guns are always locked onto you, and enemies can start firing as they enter the screen from any angle, means it's going to cost you a lot of money just to finish one round. How much? Let's take a tally. At one pound a credit and a total of 33 deaths, I- oh god, wrong series. The grenade is your second weapon and it's super awkward to use as its trajectory is completely random. Sometimes it flies straight and explodes while other times it's a curveball that goes over the enemy's heads. The enemy has the same equipment as you but they obviously can use it better because their guns are locked onto you at all times. Should they manage to hit you, you die in one hit and the game will respawn you in the area you died in. Die three times 
and it's back to the start. It's not just the soldiers that want to kill you though. If you spend too long in an area, Mother Nature wants to get in on it and throws a boulder at you. On the plus side, it will kill the enemies too. Just wish I could say the same about the landmines. If you do make it through the soldiers, you then enter the tank area. And if you're an idiot like me and didn't realise that this blue square was a small usable tank, it's not easy. There are two tanks you can use. The small one fires machine guns and will take out small tanks in 3 shots and big ones in 6. Meanwhile, the big tanks are hefty fuckers that will wreck everything and put the game in easy I'm gonna kill you all for pissing me off in the foot section mode. If a big tank is shot by another big tank, they will explode. If shot by a small one however, it begins to smoke. You can fix it by turning it on and off again, by which you get out and back in. Have you tried turning it off and on again? <laughs> At the end of the level is the fort you need to blow up. Now this is where the game loses me even more. Here I am in a tank that blows up anything and everything. Here is the fort. Oh, it turns out the fort is tank proof. In order to blow up the fort, you need to get out of the tank and then throw one of your grenades at it and hope that Twinkle Toes throws it at the right angle to blow it up. Once the fort is destroyed, you complete the level and you commit a war crime by tank blasting a surrendering enemy for bonus points. The level then resets with a harder challenge and a different colour scheme. Frontline's difficulty, dial control and originality helped attract the eyes of many wanting gamers, and because of this, it made it to the 7th highest grossing game in the year of its release. What kept it down was just how hard it was and the mishandling of the shooting mechanics. After these two games, there won't be a whole lot of cabinets that use the stick and dial scheme after that, let alone the aiming mechanic that made it popular itself. Now while the control scheme for these two games did fade off and became obsolete, the result of being able to aim in full 360 degrees carried on and influenced a ton of games after that, some of which we consider classics like Contra and some more modern releases like Enter the Gungeon. So, Boot Hill. Did I like it? Well, there isn't a lot to it. I could literally describe the entire game in under a minute as there is very little to the game itself. As you saw, it only has two titles in its legacy, and the rest of the video was spent talking about the evolution of its aiming mechanic rather than Boot Hill itself. I imagine with a friend, it's a lot better to play as you try and get a read on each other, but with only 70 seconds to play before you have to insert another coin, it means it'll get repetitive quick and cost you a lot of money to get the most out of it. As I said, the only real appeal of the game was the cabinet itself and the new mechanic it was employing. So for those reasons, I'm putting Boot Hill under no. What about you though? Am I being too harsh? Is there a game title I've missed? What are your memories of the game if it was part of your childhood? Would you want to give it a go? Your thoughts as always are welcome down in the comments below, and if you are curious about what other games I've covered so far, do feel free to check out the playlist. But in the meantime, thanks everyone for watching, and remember you're always welcome at the Spectrum. Mm -hmm.